Thank you, Caroline. How many of you have heard me speak before? Wonderful. Well, why don't you come on up and we'll just have you. Um, well, the, those of you that have not heard me, as Caroline said, I am a historian from the town of Grand Lake, Colorado. How many of you have been to Grand Lake? Oh, man. How many of you haven't been to Grand Lake? That might have been an easier question. Okay. Well, Grand Lake from here uh, is only about 75 miles from here at Frisco. If you're familiar with Interstate 70, uh, you can go east toward Denver and get off at exit 232 and go up and over Berthoud Pass. Or coming from Denver, you can get off and, and also go up. Um, Grand Lake is a mountain resort town, second largest city in Colorado, as you can tell by this map. <laughs> hmm. All 500 people that live there think so sometimes. Grand Lake, uh, literally within the town boundaries, has less than 500 people that live there. We have a couple thousand in the surrounding area, but uh, Grand Lake is uh, similar to Frisco, but as you can tell, much, much, much smaller. The entire town of Grand Lake is not quite a mile long and three blocks wide. Uh, it's not hard to get lost in there. Uh, you park your car over there and you a little bit of memory and you can find it again by the end of the day. So, but uh, as I mentioned, it's only about 75 miles from here. However, Grand Lake is the west entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park. Okay? And so that makes it a little easier to see on your maps also. So, well today I'd like to speak to you on the Lost Lodges of Rocky. You know, one of those things that we don't think about very much. There is a road between Grand Lake and Estes Park on the east side of Rocky Mountain National Park. And at one time or another, there have been more than 30 lodges and resorts inside what is now Rocky Mountain National Park. Some of them were there and gone long before Rocky was ever established, and we'll be talking about that. But some of them were lasted until literally the 1960s, and the last one was shut down in 2011. So I'm going to talk about some of those today. We don't have time to go into the background about each and every one of them. But um, all together inside Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, there were just over 30 of these lodges and resorts. Some of them quite large, some of them very, very small. So Rocky Mountain National Park. Just those words. Sometimes it might make you think of the wilderness. Wildlife, wonder, but what about the people? What about the people that have come to Rocky over the years? What about the people that stayed in Rocky? Where would they stay? Where would they eat? Where would they rent a horse? And that's a lot about what we're going to be talking about today. But before we talk about the lodges, I can't talk about them without talking about some of the early roads and trails in Rocky. Because like today, you built a lodge next to the road, for, so it was easy for people to stop there. But before the roads through Rocky Mountain National Park existed, we had a series of trails. These were generated by the Ute who were mountain Indians here in the Colorado area. And for centuries, literally, the talk is between 400 and 600 years ago, they were in the Grand Lake area. Well, they created a series of these trails up and over the top of the mountain because they didn't stay in the mountains in the winter time. It was only the white man that was foolish enough to think we could deal with all that white stuff. So the Utes left, but they did these trails. Well, those trails, turned into larger trails as uh, the Arapaho showed up. And then later, we said, well, why can't we follow basically some of those trails and put a road in? Well, in 1912, the state of Colorado, before Rocky was established, the state of Colorado finally listened to some of the people in Grand Lake and Estes Park and said, we really need a road up and over the top of the mountain to get in between these two communities. And so they started building what they called Fall River Road. They started on the east side over near uh, Estes Park area, and they had people hand digging. This, this was in 1912, uh, so they had uh, very little equipment available to them. So they started out with some people hand digging this road. They used the cheapest possible people they could find. Some, I heard somebody say it. Prisoners from the state pen. Even cheaper than Chinese and even cheaper than women. This was 1912. That's how our cultures were. 
okay? But the prisoners came up and they handed them picks and shovels and said, start digging and, and lay out this road. Well, amazing as that may sound, in the first two and a half years, they made it two miles on relatively flat and then they started going up where it was a little higher. Okay? They weren't going very fast. The state of Colorado had determined this road was going to take about four years to build and it's 21 miles long and it's going to be beautiful. Well, let's back up a half a step. We have state prisoners. They're out in the mountains. They've got their shirts off. They're building muscles like crazy. They're being fed three square meals a day. Okay. How hard are they going to be working? <laughs> Because when it's done, they get go to go back to the state penitentiary. So they didn't work very hard. Finally, after about three years of this nonsense, the state of Colorado said, well, now that three years has gone by, you've made it almost four and a half miles. We need to do something different. So they brought in some contractors. One started over near Estes Park, one started near Grand Lake, and, and eventually they met in the middle. But it took them nine years altogether, even with heavier equipment, to do that kind of stuff and make the Fall River Road. The day it opened, it was too steep and too narrow and too dangerous. But by 1921, Rocky Mountain National Park had been established, and Rocky had this state-operated road right through the middle of the national park. And the state said, this is our road. We will maintain it. We will take care of it. And Rocky said, but you're not. You're not doing a very good job. At one of these corners on one of the switchbacks, it was so dangerous because you know, most of us have heard about a three-point corner. You drive up and back up to get around the corner. One of these was a five-point corner. You had to drive forward, back up, back up, back up, and go around. Well, in doing that, every now and then, somebody would back off the side of the mountain. So the National Park Service and Rocky Mountain National Park decided to station a ranger there and help you drive your car around the corner. In addition, Model T's, which most of these were by now, Model T's didn't have a fuel pump. The gas tank was above the engine and it just flowed down. Well, you start up these high mountain roads and you know what I'm going to say. You ran out of gas. So you coast slowly back down to the corner and then you turn around and you back up these hills. You want to back up that? But that's what they had to do to make it happen. So Rocky Mountain National Park said, this is, this is nonsense. So finally, after a lot of political finagling, uh, in 1922, the National Park Service acquired uh, the Fall River Road. They immediately started designing a new, better road up and over the top. It was going to go up and over Tombstone Ridge. Uh, the ridge that has rocks up there looked like tombstones up on top. You can still see them today. Uh, they're just rocks. But you know, who wants to drive over Tombstone Ridge, really? So they went around Tombstone Ridge and they crossed over uh, some of the Indian trails, especially the Ute trails. Okay? This is some of the early construction on the new road that they started and it was called Trail Ridge Road because of the Ute trails. Okay? It, it actually crosses one of the trails in three places even to this day. Over on the west side of the mountain, uh, over near the Never Summer Range in the Kawanichi Valley, this is what it turned out to be. Big, wide expanse. This corner on Fall River Road is one of the few places that the two roads came together in the same spot. But when it was Fall River, it was 18 feet wide. You could barely get two Model Ts around the corner. And then it went over the edge that you see behind that car and did seven switchbacks down to the floor of the valley. It was called the Giant's Ladder extremely dangerous. So they made it much wider, much prettier. Now today it's paved. This happens to be far view curve and it's still on Trail Ridge Road, a big parking lot there and it's a beautiful view down the Kawanichi Valley. So those were the how it got started with some of the roads in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, Trail Ridge Road was finished over the top and down to the Grand Lake area in 1932, but they kept changing it, moving a corner here and there uh, as they acquired some property, and finally wasn't finished totally until about 1941. Uh, the road that we drive on today is the 1941 and 1972 and 2004 edition. So this is some of the, the gorgeous mountains, but in addition to that, we had lodges in Rocky at that time. But what about now? 
Why don't we have some of the big glorious lodges like they have in some of the other national parks? Um, and, and you can take your pick. We've got Yellowstone, we've got Yosemite, we've got Glacier, we've got Smoky Mountains. There, there's big lodges in a number of our national parks around the country, uh, down in uh, both the top and the bottom of, of Gr the Grand Canyon, for instance. So why don't we have those lodges in Rocky? Most the most common word, I should say, that I can tell you is transportation. Rocky Mountain National Park was the first national park designed around the automobile. The others were uh, uh, created and established long before the automobile was around. But Rocky was 1915, so they designed it around the tourists in the touring cars. Okay? It was now easy to get from Denver it took one day to, to go from Denver all the way up to the town of Estes Park, one day to go from Estes Park up and over the top of the mountain down to Grand Lake on the other side, one day to come back up and over Bertha Pass, US 40, over to the town of Idaho Springs on what is now Interstate 70, and then about a half a day down to Denver. All of a sudden you could visit your national park in three and a half days. <laughs> Well, Yellowstone and Yosemite, for instance, those were destination parks. It took you weeks sometimes to get there, or you rode the train. For instance, in Yosemite, they didn't allow cars in the park until 1917 because the train barons said, no, our train brings hundreds of people at a time. The, the hotels in Yellowstone were built by the train companies to handle their passengers. And once you got there, you rode around Yellowstone by stagecoach that were owned by the train company. So they didn't even allow cars until 1917. So that's what you ha the differences in some of those national parks. Well, here's a map of Rocky Mountain National Park, and I realize from, the, uh, from probably the front, you're not going to see it very well. Uh, but this actually has the locations of a number of these different lodges that we're going to be talking about. I'd like to start on the west side of the Continental Divide, the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. Over there is the Kawanichi Valley. This is an Arapaho word. But we're going to start at the very far north end to the top of the map that you see. And again, I'm not expecting you to read all the different lodges, but where the words are highlighted there are each of the lodges that seem to be in the Kawanichi Valley. One of these was there long before Rocky Mountain National Park was ever uh, thought of, much less established. Um, the, we had gold and silver miners in the area, but the gold and silver were terrible. There wasn't very much of it, and the quality of it was so poor, nobody would come and process it. However, seven different uh, towns sprang up in this valley that you see, the Kawanichi Valley, okay? because of all the gold miners. None of them lasted more than about four years. The guys came in, they mined it, they found out the gold wasn't any good, and, and they up and left. One of the towns at the far north end of this valley was named Lulu City. It was started by a man by the name of Benjamin Burnett. He had named his gold mine after his oldest daughter, Lulu. And he was near a real flat spot, not too far from what we now know of the Colorado River. And he said, you know what? I'll bet I can make more money by selling that land than I ever can by digging in the dirt over here. So he established Lulu City. Not too far from there, there was another mine and it was owned and operated by a man by the name of Bob Wheeler. And Bob Wheeler didn't make any money at his gold mine, so he left. By now it's uh, the late 1800s and Bob Wheeler went to serve in the Spanish-American War in 1898. He came back to the Kawanichi Valley because he loved it. He loved it so much he started out in Lulu City where there was a large hotel and Bob Wheeler uh, owned a couple of the cabins there and so he started renting them out. There was also a three-story hotel in Lulu City. This is Lulu City almost at the end of its time in 1889. I don't know what she thinks she's going to be sweeping out there on that dirt trail. <laughs> but. But Lulu had uh, wives of the miners because it was later in our mining era in, in Colorado. And by now, many of the miners had gotten married. Yes, they had women that worked in the saloons, okay? But the wives kept those women under control. And they say they tried to keep their husbands under control, but, okay? Well, 
Bob Wheeler uh, had his mind. This is Bob in the, in the door of his mind. And he was in Lulu City for a couple years after the uh, Spanish-American War. But more and more people were riding horseback on the Indian trails up and over from Estes Park down into the valley of, uh, and down to the town of Grand Lake. Bob Wheeler said, what if I put a hotel up? I could get these people at the end of the road before they ever turned to go down 10 miles to Grand Lake. I could charge them a dollar a night. <laughs> and when you left Estes Park, everybody said, go follow the trail and stop at Bob Wheeler's house. You've got a, a fresh cooked meal coming because Bob is a great cook, which he was. He was really known to be a, a wonderful cook. So you'd look down over the hillside and see this place. That's uh, Bob Wheeler's cabin. And off to the left, barely in the picture, there's a tent cabin, kind of half log and then a canvas top on it. Well, you'd look down on this from up on the hillside, you'd hit the trifecta. You'd been on your horse for a week, sometimes two weeks, you were on vacation. You smelled like your horse, everybody else did. But you'd look down there and said, oh, that's a home cooked meal. I've been cooking over an open fire on the ground for the last couple weeks. I get off my bedroll. He's got tent cabins, there's a cot inside there. I'm not living on the ground. And look, out back is the Colorado River, that's a bath. I've hit the trifecta. <laughs> so that's where you would stay, was at squeaky Bob Wheeler's camp, or Hotel de Hardscrabble, as he called it. A lot of work with very little return. But Bob did expand uh, his place. You can see a lot more of the tent cabins that he added on the trees because this was a great financial deal. He was the first hotel between Estes Park and Grand Lake, okay? Bob didn't have very many rules, but he had some. <laughs> well, during the Spanish-American War, Bob was a horse handler. We don't know for a fact whether he actually handled horses for Teddy Roosevelt or not. We do know that he knew Teddy Roosevelt. He became friends with him during the Spanish-American War. And Teddy Roosevelt decided to visit Bob Wheeler's Hotel de Hardscrabble. Okay. Okay. He was in Colorado a number of times, both during his presidency and before and after. So. Well, Bob Wheeler's health wasn't real good, so by the 19, early 1920s, he had to sell his place. A, a guest that had stayed there said, someday I'm going to come back here and I'm going to buy this place. I'm going to change the name of it to honor the Arapaho and the Ute that were here in this valley. The fourth owner bought it and changed the name to the Phantom Valley Ranch in honor of the Arapaho and the Ute. Okay. Wonderful place to stay. Here's a great shot of a family staying at the uh, Phantom Valley Ranch. Now, I'm under special restrictions on this photo. There's a young lady in this picture that is a dear friend of mine. I'm not allowed to tell you the year that this photo was taken. <laughs> and I'm certainly not allowed to tell you how she is now. But this is her and her family visiting, and now she has stayed in the Grand Lake area and operates a B&B &B of her own. Okay? Well, with the Phantom Valley Ranch, up on the road that was now being finished up, Fall River Road and then soon to be Trail Ridge Road, what did you have to have for your car? Gasoline. So what did you have to have near a, a dude ranch type of operation? A trading post, of course. Because there you could get Indian goods. None of them were very authentic, we all know that. Nothing like what they do today. But at the trading post, <laughs> at the trading post, you would see a sign out front, pop and candy. It didn't say Coke, it didn't say Pepsi, anything like that, but you knew that you could get cold soda pop, you could get candy, you could get gas for your car, you could go in and get gas for you. But at a trading post, the Indian goods that they had. How many of you might remember stopping at a trading post and you got a little Tom Tom drum? Okay, you're sitting there with that little plastic paddle beating the heck out of it and about a half mile down the road it comes from the front seat. If you don't stop beating on that thing, it's going out the window. Well, so they tell me. Um, I lost more than one out the window, I'll put it that way. You actually stayed at the Phantom Valley, or stopped no, at the no. Phantom Valley Trading Post? Yeah. Great, yeah. To Holdsworth Ranch. Okay, 
We're going to talk about that in a minute too. So, so the trading post was there, so you could literally uh, be the first gas station before Grand Lake and get gas for your car, or going either way up and over the top of, of Trail Ridge Road. <coughs> Further down the valley, uh, almost 10 miles away, close to the town of Grand Lake, was another family that came and homesteaded. This was the Harbison family. They started a dairy ranch to provide um, fresh milk to the townspeople at the town of Grand Lake. They, they homesteaded in 1896. Well, they saw what Bob Wheeler had done in 1906 with his uh, tent cabins, and they said, hmm, we're selling milk for five cents a quart, we're selling ice for 10 cents, what if we could charge a dollar a night? <laughs> so eventually, over several years, they actually built seven of these small cabins. This happens to be the, the Emerson and, and the bird's nest that they built. But they would eventually have seven of these because, again, they were right on the road and they were a couple miles before you got to Grand Lake. So they got to charge you a dollar a night to stay in their cabins. A few years start tumbling by and finally, January 26, 1915, President Woodrow Wilson signed the bill establishing Rocky Mountain National Park. The people on the east side of the mountain over near Estes Park were ecstatic. They'd been working for years to get this new national park. And finally, after six bills through Congress, it, it was signed off and then President Wilson signed it. And so they said, we've got to have a party. Who's going to snowshoe from Denver to Estes Park in January? <laughs> How about we have a summertime party next summer in the mountains of Colorado? Everybody will show up. Literally, it doesn't show it in this picture, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people did show up for the dedication on September 4th, 1915. It rained off and on all day long. So much for party in the mountains. That happens, okay? The very next year, 1916, the National Park Service was established. You know, Rocky was our 10th national park. By now, we had all these national parks. They were loosely and very loosely overseen by the United States Army, just to put them under somebody, okay? But each of them were writing letters to Congress and to the president. We need more money. We need more people. We need more buildings. Most of all, we need more money. Please help us out. Well, finally, as I mentioned, the National Park Service was established to kind of be the umbrella in the Department of Interior to oversee the development and the operation of all of our national parks. Okay? As soon as the National Park was established, it got to be controversial. Their mission statement, if you will, also known as the National Park Organic Act, and this is a very small part of it, it's pages and pages long, but this is basically their mission statement. They were uh, said that they would work to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and wildlife therein in our national parks. Provide for the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for future generations. Doesn't that sound like a double standard to you? Mm. We want you to enjoy your national park, but we want it unimpaired for future generations. That statement for the last 105 years almost has been really hard to comply with in all of our national parks. We want it open to everybody, but we don't want anything to happen to it. The first director of the, of the National Park Service on a na nationwide basis was in Rocky Mountain National Park for their dedication in September in 1915. He's the gentleman in the, in the middle here. Uh, his name is Stephen Mather. Uh, that's Mr. Uh, Trowbridge on the left. He was the first superintendent of Rocky Mountain National Park. On the right is Horace Albright. Horace Albright would become the first assistant director of the National Park Service. Stephen Mather was a very wealthy individual. He was the heir to the Borax Soap Company. He donated land um, in many parts of our country to establish national parks on. Okay? He worked for free. He agreed to be the superintendent for up to five years without charging the government a penny. He traveled all over the world encouraging people to visit our, our national parks. Stephen Mather was a, 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 just a wonderful man. But his take, if you will, on the Organic Act. This is what he said in 1920. In the administration of the parks, I don't have to read it all of, to you, but he wanted the greatest good to the greatest number of people. That's always the most important factor, isn't it? What about leaving it unimpaired for future generations? It doesn't say it in there, does it? We just want as many people as we can in our national parks. 
However, he didn't always agree with his assistant director of the National Park Service, Horace Albright. Because in 1922, Horace Albright had heard John Muir say, we are loving our national parks to death. And so Horace Albright wrote this. He was already concerned about the overdevelopment of our national parks and all the hot dog stands and all the hotels and all the camps. And, and he said, we got too many of them. We need to cleanse our national parks and get rid of a bunch of these. What had happened in Rocky Mountain National Park? There were already a number of resorts there when Rocky was established in 1915. Some of these started out as private homes or small cattle ranches or homesteads. And under an agreement with the National Forest Service, they had built a hotel because more and more tourists were coming, especially to the Estes Park side. Well, Rocky took over land that was inside what was the National Forest. So they just took on what they called concessionaire's permits. These people had permission to operate under a concessionaire permit. They could make all the money they wanted to, okay? When Rocky took over, they were saddled with all these lodges that were already there under these same concessionaire permits. But many times they just extended them almost automatically. But just a few years later, Stephen Mather wrote again, he wanted to grant more franchises for hotels and uh, they called them permanent camps, the same thing as a resort, and operation of transportation lines, bus tours, that kind of stuff, and many other services, including later, he would add golf courses to the list for our national parks. Everybody wants to go in the national park and play golf. While they were discussing this, and I could stand here and talk for hours on the ideologies, ide ideologies and the philosophy of what do we do with our national parks. It, it just is that convoluted. But while they were talking about this, we just started building more hotels. The Holtzworth Ranch that you stayed at, the Holtzworth Ranch, again, started as a cattle ranch. John and Sophia Holtzworth uh, came to the Grand Lake area because John had had a saloon down in the Denver area and Prohibition hit. He needed something else to do. He came up and started a cattle ranch. Well, right about that same time, they were finishing Fall River Road over the top, and he said, you know, I'm no dummy. I can make a lot more money off a tourist than I ever could raising a few cows taking them all the way to Denver to try and sell the meat. So he, uh, uh, John Sr. and his son Johnny, who took over the operation of the ranch because John Sr. had an accident and was pretty much uh, uh, invalid, but Johnny took over the ranch when he was 22 years old and he started expanding it because of all the tourists. He started the Holsworth Ranch, then they started to expand out and had a dude ranch operation. You could come and, and rent a horse for the day and Johnny Holsworth would take you anywhere you wanted to go. He, he knew that countryside like the back of his hand. He really did. He was really good at it. In addition to that, they had the Holsworth Dude Ranch. Okay. In addition to that, they built another hotel out along the side of the highway and called it the Holsworth Trout Lodge. Johnny was an outdoorsman. If you went in there and said, I want to catch 50 trout for, for dinner tonight, he'd help you catch 50 or 60 or 70 trout. If you wanted elk on your menu that night, he'd take you out and help you hunt an elk. Just don't tell the rangers where you got it. <laughs> Yeah, the rangers knew Johnny El Holsworth was taking an elk out of Rocky every now and then. but. At the end of the day, you'd have a big campfire discussion and Johnny would sit around and talk some of his tales and just have a wonderful conversation. And I knew Johnny Holdsworth a little bit just before he passed away in the early 1970s, but Johnny Holdsworth, most of the time at these campfires, what he told you was the truth. <laughs> He'd only stretch it a little bit, okay? But this was right outside their, their main lodge area. A few years later, uh, this gentleman took over the leadership in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, this is uh, a gentleman by the name of, uh, I've got to look at Claude, I forgot his first name, Claude Way. Uh, he took over, he was the superintendent in 1921. You know, every national park, the superintendent has to do a monthly report. They, they, it goes into a file and goes back into Washington, a copy of it. This tells what happened in the park that, that month and, and you know how many visitors we had and, and so forth and so on. Uh, projects and how they're, they're uh, advancing. Well, in 1921, uh, Claude Way wrote this. He said, I left Estes Park on January 11th on an inspection trip to Grand Lake, also to look at a site for a new camp, 
a new lodge, if you will, which may be erected by a Mr. A.D. Lewis. I found a very desirable location within the boundaries of the park. This location is easy of access from the main road and is within a short walking distance from Grand Lake, but also affords the desired degree of isolation and will, I believe, be accepted by Mr. Lewis. It is, I believe, highly desirable that this camp be located on national park lands rather than upon private lands in the village of Grand Lake. In the event of their locating on national park lands, there would be no question as our authority to regulate them. Aside from this, this location would, I believe, better serve the people by giving them a most desirable outlook. Okay. Oh, good. So let's build another one inside the National Park in 1921. Okay. This one that he suggested be built was not built by Mr. A.D. Lewis. Mr. A.D. Lewis paid to have it built, but it was owned and operated by a man by the name of Roe Emery out of Estes Park. It was the Grand Lake Lodge. Any of you stayed at the Grand Lake Lodge? Okay. Well, the Grand Lake Lodge was built on the side of the hill overlooking the town of Grand Lake. It's still open today. It operates and you can go up and see a beautiful, beautiful view up there. But this is what it looked like early on. And some more flyers that they had about the beautiful Grand Lake Lodge located within Rocky Mountain National Park which means the park regulated the prices that they could charge and how many people could stay there and how many out cabins they could build and that kind of stuff because of what the superintendent Claude Way said in 1921, we will regulate them if they build it inside the park. Here's the interior of the Grand Lake Lodge. It doesn't look hardly anything like that anymore except the circular fireplace. It still stands, but they've redone the entire interior of it. The beams up above you are all logs and they leave those exposed, but, but, uh, and the circular fireplace. Great place to sit and just enjoy the, the wonderful fire. Okay. The Grand Lake Lodge did a land transfer in 1963. They bought some land that they knew the National Park wanted that joined the park and they did a land swap for that land for the land that the Grand Lake Lodge was located on so that they now could be a part of the in the city limits of Grand Lake and have proper infrastructure. They were able to install a sewer system, bring better electricity, expand and, and stuff like that. So since 1963 it's been outside of Rocky Mountain National Park. But Rocky was growing. As early as 1920, Rocky had 240,000 people go through in 1920, five years after they'd opened. That's more than three times as many people as Yosemite or Yellowstone had that very same year. Just amazing statistic. Rocky has always been like that. Well, Horace Albright took over as director of the National Park Service when Stephen Mather uh, stepped down in 1929, and immediately uh, he started doing more what he called cleansing of our national parks. He, he really wanted to get rid of some of these buildings and lodges and private property within all of our national parks, but especially Rocky. I think he had a, a very special uh, place in his heart for Rocky Mountain National Park. He visited Rocky a number of times. Here's Horace Albright the director of the National Park Service, feeding bears. Well, you know, in, in 1930, that was kind of okay. Yeah, of course, it's not now, and we know that. But look at the leg on that table. It's had a lot of bears leaning on it, really, it has, okay? So Horace Albright came up with a plan to start purchasing some of these properties. But of course, the National Park Service had no money to do this with. This was just a, a wonderful dream of his to, to purchase some of these properties. And then he wrote some of this because he wanted our national parks open to the people so they could behold this gorgeous scenery. But he called it a patriotic plan to safeguard the interest and protection for all time of this wonderfully beautiful park. Talking about Rocky Mountain National Park. Okay, so again, it was back to that, that age-old dilemma, do we have private property inside our national park or do we leave it open for the greatest good of the greatest number of people? And how do we control that kind of stuff? So I want to move down further down the Kawanichi Valley because at the same time he wrote this in 1930, we built another hotel. 
This was the Kawanichi Lodge in, in the Kawanichi Valley. It was right on the side of the Colorado River, built in 1931. And again, families would come here. They never had a large capacity. They'd only hold about 35 or 40 people maximum. And they had two large outbuildings. These buildings, the National Park Service acquired that land and took over in 1967. They removed all of the Kawanichi Lodge except these two large buildings and they kept them and used them for employee housing for some of the park rangers. Uh, finally, their condition was so bad that in 1970 they, they went ahead and, and uh, burned them down. Uh, so there's nothing left of the Kawanichi Lodge. Further down the road, uh, about a mile from the Kawanichi Lodge, was the Green Valley or Green Mountain Ranch. This started as a homestead and a small cattle ranch. Uh, the gentleman that started it, uh, Mr. Hertel, sold it to um, uh, Henry Schnorr. Henry Schnorr built a house. This house right here, that's his kitchen window and the house. And then later he sold it and they added several wings to it and, and several hotel rooms so they could take it from a cattle operation to a ranch, a dude ranch. Some of the first people were the Holsworths to start using that term dude ranch because you got on a horse. Well, the Green Mountain Ranch would rent you horses. Okay? Right next to it, and they shared a property line, was the Onahu Ranch. Started as a small cattle ranch and said, hey, Green Mountain's making a little bit of money. Why don't we expand and we'll turn our cattle ranch in to a, a dude ranch also and make money that way. So the Onahu Ranch opened up. This is their early flyer. And there she is welcoming, welcoming you out at the gate. Doesn't that look like you want to be there? Just spend some time. Come and spend a week or two here. Again, the Anahu Ranch did not have a large capacity. Uh, this was their dining room and, and kitchen area, and kind of open area. Uh, this building still remains on the, of the Anahu Ranch. Uh, it still is used for the National Park employees. Okay? It's, it's not available to go see or anything like that. Um, our trail crews that, that work on the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park, they use this for their dining room and their recreation center. Our trail crews, you know, Rocky Mountain National Park has over 387 miles of trails that are all maintained by wonderful, wonderful gang. Uh, the trail crews on both sides of the National Park. They usually hike in and backpack in and camp out for 10 days in their small tents and work on a section of trail. Then they hike out and they have four days off and then they go in for 10 days and out. And so this is their, their uh, gathering place for their kitchen for when they come back. But our towns, Estes Park and Grand Lake, were seeing more and more tourism also, and they were growing. And so they started building lodges within the boundaries of the town, outside of the National Park, including the, one of the very first motels in the country. <laughs> this was one of those wonderful places called actually a motor court before they came up with the word motel. It came from motor court, but you would park your Model T under the roof and then your room and then a carport and a room and a carport and a room and a carport. Of course the bathroom was the little building out back with the quarter moon in the window, in the door, okay? But, uh, but you got a carport for your car. Very new and very modern. This was built in 1915. Still stands today. The Grand Lake Historical Society owns it and uh, hopefully it'll be open next year for, for tours. But, um, but this building itself was built in 1915. It is the oldest in the country in its original condition. There's more in Colorado that were built in 1908, but they've been changed and changed and changed and all of them have bathrooms. But this is in its original condition. So uh, hopefully it'll be open for you to see next year. Well, let's jump up and over the top of the mountain and we're gonna go over to the east side of the Continental Divide or the east side of Rocky Mountain National Park. I want to start with uh, um, a map of the entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park. For those of you that may not have gone through the National Park, uh, when you leave Estes Park, you leave downtown, and downtown is, is down this road here, just about a mile and a half, two miles away. Actually, the town limits are right there, but you come up this road, you go into uh, the Beaver Meadows Visitor Center right here, and then you go up and over, not uh, quite a mile, to the Beaver Meadows Entrance Station, the gate where you pay to get into Rocky Mountain National Park. I had to scurry over one early uh, Sunday morning so I could get a picture with not too many people at the gate. They have four entrance gates over there uh, on a busy holiday weekend or busy almost any time now on a busy weekend, especially in September weekends for the fall color. The average wait to get through this gate is approximately one and a half hours to two hours to sit in line 
to get to this gate, to get into Rocky. Okay, this is the primary gate. Well, if you go up the road just a little bit, at very little, less than a third of a mile from the Beaver Meadow entrance station, you turn left and you go down the, the road here and you enter Moraine Park. Okay, here's the entrance station and this is Moraine Park today. It didn't always look like that. It's always been very peaceful, but it has changed a time or two over the years. In 1905, a, a lady came and, and visited one of the other lodges in the area, and she said, I love the Estes area. I love the Moraine Park area. She came to the Moraine Park, and she built a house up on the side of the hill, called her house the Hillside, and she saw tourists and more tourists and more tourists. She built herself a lodge the Moraine Park Lodge. It was, certainly was not the first one, but it's the first one on that road that I showed you. So she built a, a lodge. Again, she had a capacity of about 18 people there. But she had uh, an automobile that would go into Estes and meet the auto stage, as they called it, the automobile coming up from the train in Lyons, Colorado, and she'd meet you there and take you out to her lodge. She had a recreation hall that she built up on the side of the hill, kind of, we'd know it as a little rec center today, just wherever you needed to do. If you wanted to take some classes, she, she did some knitting classes and that kind of stuff. Well, much later in the 1930s, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, brought several crews to uh, the Grand Lake area and Rocky Mountain National Park, as well as Estes Park. And the CCC renovated that building so that the National Park wouldn't tear it down. And they took over the recreation center and uh, turned it into the Rocky Mountain National Park Museum. You can, it's open to visit uh, today. It's on the east side of the mountain. It's a wonderful small museum to, and they have wonderful ag exhibits about the Ute and Arapaho as the early settlers and that kind of stuff over there. So that building still remains. Her large lodge was torn down uh, in the 1940s. Very early on, over on the Estes side area, some of the earliest pioneers over there were a gentleman and his wife by the name of Abner and Alberta Sprague. They came here to, they had heard about the wonderful beauty of the area uh, that was called Estes Park, and they came up and looked at settling. Well, they brought 11 adults with them that were all capable of filing a 160-acre homestead in the middle of Moraine Park. So now we have 12 160-acre homesteads covering Moraine Park, all touching each other, because they were all family. So they owned a lot of that picture of what you saw in Moraine Park. As a matter of fact, here's a picture from their collection of Moraine Park. That's what it looked like when they got here. So Abner built his, his wife a, a small house, and they were living there, and people kept showing up because the Rocky Mountain News newspaper in Denver, William Byers, had been to Estes and loved the area, so he was publicizing it, talking about it all the time in his newspaper, and more and more people were visiting Estes Park by horseback, and they'd stop at Abner and, and Alberta's house and say, oh, this is gorgeous up here, can we stay at your house for a couple days? <laughs> well, they took him in. But Alberta eventually, and it probably didn't take very long, said, you know, if we're going to keep feeding these people, we're either going to go broke feeding them or we're going to start charging them a little bit. So they started charging them a minimal fee. But more and more people would show up. So Abner Sprague, he said, well, I'll just add on to the house. <laughs> he just added on a little bit to his house and started the Sprague Hotel. Excuse me, the Sprague Lodge, as he called it. And he bought himself a stagecoach. There was two tracks through the weeds. Okay? And he'd take you up. This was the 1880s and 1890s, long before Rocky. But he'd take you out sightseeing. And, and uh, you could spend the night at their lodge. And Abner, uh, his wife, Alberta, was a pretty good cook. And so they had it going pretty well. Well, Al um, Abner Sprague had been an engineer on, on one of the railroads, and he left Estes Park to go back to work for the railroad in 1904. In 1902, he had taken on a partner, John Stead, and so when Abner uh, left, John Stead just took over the operation of the hotel, and he expanded it a little bit more. And he put the outbuildings, similar to the motor court that you saw in Grand Lake, and the big lodge, and, and kept expanding it, and kept ex expanding it. Uh, uh, the Stead Lodge would eventually grow to this. In the Moraine Valley, they could now handle almost 200 people a night. 
They had horseback riding, they had swimming, they had multiple tours into what would become, well, by then it would be Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is where the golf course was located in Rocky Mountain National Park. It didn't even start up until 1938. And they expanded the golf course about four times over the years. Okay? So they had a golf course there in the Moraine Valley. Well, right up the road from the, from the uh, Stead Lodge was, a, and somebody in the audience, and I don't recognize anybody, but somebody asked me about the Brynwood Hotel. The Brynwood was up by now at the end of the, the roadway, okay? This is uh, the Brynwood Hotel, and you could stay here, and they had several outbuildings, and again, they expanded it several different times. But the Brynwood was under a concessionaire's permit. I talked about that a little bit earlier, how you could get a, a permit to operate it. This was originally built in 1912, uh, but eventually they, they could handle 90 people there overnight. They, they had their pigs and their cows for food for everybody there, but they also milked their cows, and at the beginning they delivered milk downtown Estes Park. So the Park Service bought the land that the Brynwood s sold on, and I have to keep looking at my notes for make sure I tell you the right date. They bought the land in 1932, but they operated that under a concessionaire's permit until just after 1958. And then by 1960, all of these buildings were removed. Okay. They had to be buying the land from the hotel operator or the lodge operator? Uh-huh. Yeah, they bought, it had been a homestead that had been added onto, they had bought another homestead. And so the park bought the 296 acres and said, you can, you can keep your lodge there and you can operate it, you know, and we'll allow you to, is what the concessionaire's permit was, okay? Well, the road at that time ended at the Brynwood Lodge, but there were other hotels further up. The next one, you hiked about three miles to get to from the Brynwood, and you went to the Forest Inn at the pool. This is on the small, very small at that, uh, at that juncture, the small Big Thompson River. Okay? So you'd hike three miles up the Big Thompson, and there literally still is a pool of water there, and you'd go up and you'd stay at the Forest Inn at the pool. Okay? Doesn't that look like a great place to stay? except it started as tent cabins. <laughs> okay, a couple of gentlemen, a, a, a couple of Higby brothers uh, built the uh, forest inn and they didn't keep it very long. They actually sold it to a Mr. Byerly in 1917 and he was operating it, but he was getting, his hands were getting pretty full with some other acquisitions that he had. So his wife asked her sister and, and brother-in-law to come in and they actually managed the forest inn for Mr. and Mrs. Byerly. Okay? They kept adding on to it and they kept building. They did build that main lodge that you saw. They built that in, in 1918 and it burned down in 1919 after a lightning strike hit it. Okay? But again, it, it was a tent cabin and, and they had more and more. Well, the techers, the people that were managing it, they had signed this um, concessionaire's permit and they got an extension until 1952. Okay. So they, they were operating it like a great lodge that it was. And then after 1952, the Park Service started extending it on a one-year basis. So now you operated for a year, but you didn't know if you were going to be in business the next year. Okay, because you had permission that first year. Well, a little further up from the forest inn, if you hiked another four miles up, you would get to the... Um, here we go. <laughs> you get to the Fern Lake Lodge. Okay. Again, this is on the side of Fern Lake at the top of the, of the uh, Big Thompson Stream by then. So you just hike up. This was located about 9,600 feet elevation. Didn't have a, a large capacity. They had a couple of cabins outside, but again, not a large capacity. Just a wonderful, and most of this building, I understand, was mostly the kitchen area because they always had that. But they added on the back uh, another wing and a couple of outbuildings. But the Fern Lake Lodge also became a favorite site of the Colorado Mountain Club, the hiking club that is still exists today. But the Colorado Mountain Club discovered the Fern Lake Lodge and they started using it in the wintertime. 
one of the few places that they could stay in the winter. And actually, at that period, it was the only lodge that was open in the winter time. So they started having their winter carnival at the Fern Lake Lodge. That first year, they did report an injury. One gentleman broke his arm. That was it. So they would ski in and out uh, all the way back uh, down the road. But, well, we're up at the top of that road that I showed you, so let's go backwards. We're going to go back up here is the Fern Lake Lodge. We're going to just wander back down here to the Brynwood and the uh, Sprague or Slash Steads Hotel back Marine Park. And we're going to go to the right. And we're going to go further up this road toward Bear Lake. We're going to jump up and over the top of the hill and come over here to the Bear Lake Road. And the first place we'll talk about is right there at the top called Camp Woods. Camp Woods started as a grocery store because the first road came out of Estes Park and it came up this direction. Now, today it continues up here to the YMCA Camp of the Rockies, but uh, at that time it crossed the river right here. Okay? And so Camp Woods was right there and he had a grocery store. He was selling goods to the people of, of the town of Grand Lake. Um, and uh, that type of area, and this was in what they call Glacier Basin, right alongside the road. And this is Camp Woods. Not very big, but again, he wasn't a financial dummy. He said, wait a minute, if I put up a couple places, people will stop and spend money here and rent a lodge and maybe buy a few things at my store, and he got to expand his store a little bit. Here's one of his great uh, season's greeting cards, a Christmas card that he sent out. For those of you that may know the name Enos Mills, the father of Rocky Mountain National Park, big proponent of Rocky, that's Enos standing there feeding the deer in the middle of the winter. Of course, when Enos was still alive, that was certainly allowed. Okay? But you see down at the bottom the motor court cottages that were at Camp Woods. Well, later this was removed in the 1950s because the Park Service changed the roadway and changed the entrance to Rocky. Right up the road from Camp Woods, another gentleman came back into the Estes Valley. His name was Abner Sprague. He had come back in 1911. He said, you know, that hotel business, that was kind of fun. I'd like to see more people and, and have them visit Estes Park and just see the area. So he decided to go into competition with his old partner, and he built the Sprague's Hotel. Okay. He did this about 1912, they put it in, but he did something different. He said, I know how I can get even more people to some, come. I'll have something nobody else has. He dug a lake out in front, right on the stream, and he got fish. So people could come and fish right in front of the hotel. Anything to get you to stay there, right? The hotel is long gone, but the lake stays. But here's some of the uh, Sprague's Hotel in the area. Again, added more and more buildings. He never got to the 200 capacity that the uh, Stead's Lodge got to. Uh, number one, he was confined by some gullies and everything else. But, but he, he did get it to where they could handle about 55 people overnight. Okay? And you could stay there. Uh, again, he operated this later under a concessionaire's permit that went on for several years. And then finally, the concessionaire's permit um, ended. The lodges were all removed by the Park Service. But Sprague's Lake, for any of you that might have been into Rocky Mountain National Park on the east side, Sprague's Lake is there, has a beautiful concrete trail around it, a wonderful picnic area. It's a great place to stop and, and just enjoy it. And it looks very natural but it was hand dug by Sprague and, and some of his employees. Okay? Further up the road, as a matter of fact, at the very end of the road from Sprague's, is the Bear Lake Lodge, okay? right near Bear Lake. This is the uh, part of the buildings. Now, this was not the lodge itself. Uh, upstairs was the kitchen area, downstairs was the laundry and everything else. Their primary lodge, which I do not have a picture of, was out in back. And then they had uh, quite a bit of land out there, so they built some outbuildings. And they were one of the first people to start selling individual lots. Excuse me. Um, they were selling individual lots. So you had a cabin and you could buy it, and now you own that. And then Rocky Mountain National Park came in and said, now we've got even more private property owners that we have to deal with eventually. But that's what was happening on and on. Okay? And then uh, by 1915, they'd extended the road on up to Bear Lake. 
this is about 300 feet from the lake and you could go fishing if you wanted to. And, and then later, a gentleman came and approached him, uh, the owner. By the way, this was owned by Mr. Byerly again. Uh, he owned the forest end. He, I didn't tell you, but he also opened the Fern Lake Lodge. He had a little bit of a holding in the Brynwood Lodge. And then he also opened the, the Bear Lake Lodge. So that's why he had to have people helping him out. He got all of that accomplished by 1920 and then he left. And he left it all to his wife and she started running it. She married another gentleman from, from uh, Estes Park and they continued running under the concessionaire's permit. So Rocky Mountain came in 1915. In 1921, Mr. Byerly, just before he left, made a deal with a gentleman by the name of Frank Cheely. Frank Cheely wanted to open a summer boys camp in the mountains of, of uh, Colorado and he chose inside Rocky Mountain National Park at the Bear Lake Lodge, okay? And because Mr. Byerly owned the land, he said, sure, we can do that. So they started the Camp Hayaha, an Arapaho word for boulder in the stream or boulder in the lake. They started the Bear Lake Trail School for boys. Very, very successful. The first summer uh, they had, uh, in 1921, they had 24 boys show up. By 1924, they had to add on. They now had dormitories and other visitor cabins so you could come and see your kids and, and stuff like that. And then in 1924, they'd already grown to 60 kids, and now including girls, thank goodness. Okay? And here's a colorized um, uh, postcard of that era showing the boys out in the woods. And again, they'd come for two, sometimes three weeks just to camp for the summer. They quickly outgrew this. You could see how fast it was escalating. And they quickly outgrew the facility. Uh, so by 1927, uh, Frank Cheely moved it down to uh, where it is today, down on Fish Creek Road, just outside uh, of downtown Estes Park. And over the years, this has served tens of thousands of children at the Colorado Chile camp for chill for kids okay it's a wonderful thing but they moved part of the Bear Lake Lodge when the Park Service came in and acquired the property somebody said well can we have one of those buildings and so they sold it to them probably for ten dollars like they did most of them but it's now at a private campground right at on the outside of Rocky Mountain National Park this part of the main lodge of the campground is the original lodge of Bear Lake. Okay? Let's repurpose it. Greatest use for a building is repurpose it, find a new use for it. It really was. Okay? So these concessionaires permits that I've been talking about and talking about and talking about, they continued. Okay? We're going to go back to the road. We're up here at the end of the road at Bear Lake and Bear Lake Lodge. We're going to go back down the hills to Sprague's Lake, down through the Glacier Basin, back up and over the top of the hill and back to the road to the main road into Rocky Mountain National Park that winds up and it comes up to the top of the road here up to the Deer Ridge area. Okay, Great hiking point but before it was hiking there was the Deer Ridge Chalet located up there. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Oral, Orville Bechtel started this little place. This started as a little tiny gift shop probably eight feet by 10 feet, maybe at the most, selling Indian goods, because at that time you were going over by horseback. Well, when they expanded a little bit and Fall River Road wasn't too far away, uh, and now he had automobile traffic, so he added on. And then they had a road up and over the hill that I just showed you from the uh, Glacier Basin and Bear Lake Road up and over to the Horseshoe Ranch, uh, over the top so you could ride horseback on a rugged road and so he expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded and kept selling Indian goods finally by 1933 he'd done an addition of a 50-foot tower because more and more people were stopping by in their automobiles you could climb the tower it cost 25 cents but now you're on top of a hill that looked down on two of these gorgeous parks with inside Rocky Mountain National Park just a beautiful view up there and more and more people came and then they expanded Trail Ridge Road and it came right in front of his place and he said, okay, let's expand it some more. Now he had several cabins out back, but this was the main lodge area, had a restaurant there in the lodge. They could only handle about 24 people, but now the gift, the uh, tower was surrounded by the lodge and now the tower was free. 
because you went up the tower and you came down the tower right into the gift shop. <laughs> so it was free to climb the tower, okay? Finally, in 1958, Rocky Mountain National Park changed the entrance from down by Camp Woods to where it is now through the Beaver Meadows entrance station, and they brought it up, and it ran right in front of the place. It came up the hill, and this actually on the right-hand side is the road. That's Trail Ridge Road. Well, people kept backing their car out into the middle of the road. And it doesn't take a dummy very long to figure out they had all kinds of accidents. They were backing out into the main roadway through Rocky Mountain National Park. So the National Park Service um, rescinded his concessionaire's pit. Uh, they told him at the end of one year that he couldn't operate any longer. And so they tore the place down. Um, a, a bit of it survives today. Uh, part of that main lodge that you see is now the Masonic Lodge, downtown Estes Park. Again, a great repurposing of the building. So they just wanted to make it safer. Well, after you leave this and you continue over the top of the hill, you drop down into Horseshoe Park. Okay, Horseshoe Park is just beautiful. This is Fall River running down it. The original Fall River Road actually came up this side of it and wandered up Fall River Road. How many of you have driven Fall River Road one way up to the top? Quite a few of you. For those of you that haven't, when you visit Rocky, go to the east side and drive up Fall River Road. It's gorgeous. It's gravel. It's one way. Beautiful Cascade Falls back there, the whole bit. The Arapaho called it Falling River. And we changed it to Fall River. And that's why the name Fall River Road. Okay? But, uh, so you go down into Horseshoe Park and you saw the Horseshoe Ranch. Okay? This was a cattle ranch. This was a homestead. Gentleman started it, built himself a house, had some cattle there. Well, he saw what was happening at, Trail, at Fall River Road and then later Fall, Trail Ridge Road and he said, well, you know, if I quit selling cows in Denver for meat, I can add on to my place just a little bit, okay? His original house is right there, okay? the dormers and everything. He added this big wing, he added this wing, a second story to most of it. Again, just to take advantage of the roadway being there. Well, he sold it. He didn't stay uh, very long, and he sold it to the Cadillac dealers in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and they bought it, and then they expanded it by putting a third story on. Okay? Well, there's kind of a house there, isn't there? <laughs> but they expanded it. Uh, finally, they'd had enough of the lodging uh, business, so they sold uh, outright uh, all of it to the National Park Service in 1931, the first true purchase of a lodge by the National Park Service. And by 1934, the park had removed all of the buildings and all the remnants of it. Right around the corner from him was the Fall River Lodge. Okay? They saw what Abner Sprague had done in 1911, and they said, hey, We'll just dig a, a little bit of a lake out there right on the side of Fall River and let it fill up with fish. And guess what we get to do? Have everybody fishing at our lodge. They didn't build this until 1914 because they knew that people were going to be coming to a new national park. And the road, Fall River Road, was started in 1912, almost out their back door. Okay, So they built right along the roadway, just like we expect a lodge to be built. In addition to that, about a year and a half later, there was a dedication of Rocky Mountain National Park in September of 1915. I told you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people showed up for it. This site is about 300 feet from that hotel I just showed you, the Fall River Lodge. They were kind of busy for a couple of years. Okay? And then uh, the gentleman that, that uh, built it, Mr. March, he passed away suddenly in 1917, but his wife kept operating it uh, until 1946. Uh, and she had married a gentleman from Estes Park. The river behind him, they, they have a joining of the rivers. The Roaring River is back there. And he put an electric generation plant back there on the Roaring River. So they had the first lodge with electricity up there. And they had Fall River. They diverted a little bit of it. And the, uh, the uh, bathroom on the first floor had fresh running water. Okay. You get inventive sometimes. Well, further down the road to Odessa's Park, once they moved the road and called it Trail Ridge, uh, in the 1930s, while they were still discussing tearing all of these down, they built the Cascade Lodge right on the side of the road. The Cascade Lodge 
had uh, 11 cabins out back and this main lodge. Again, lightning hit the building and it burned to the ground in 1939, but the family kept those 11 lodge, uh, buildings out back, the cabins, and they continued operating those as rental cabins for many, many years. As a matter of fact, this is the last property to have been uh, taken over by Rocky Mountain National Park. In 2011, the family finally got tired of renting out cabins and, and the younger uh, family didn't want to do it anymore. And so they said, we're going we're gonna to shut down the rental cabins. Uh, Rocky Mountain National Park being, they, they could have purchased the land, but it's a, a multi, multi, multi-year process through Congress to approve it. So the Friends Organization of Rocky Mountain National Park, the Rocky Mountain Conservancy, actually purchased the land and then they donated the land and these buildings to Rocky Mountain National Park a couple years later. So it's, it's now belongs to Rocky Mountain National Park as of 2016. Um, what are they going to do with the cabins? Um, we're in a federal government survey, so we still don't know. It's only been three years. I mean, so there's talk they might let park employee housing have them. They won't be renting them out. They they won't be rented out at all. But uh, but they're not they're not livable for you to rent. But they may put park <laughs> rangers in there. That's your national park service. I'm sorry to say it. Just so we have some transparency. I volunteer one day a week at Rocky Mountain National Park, and I am considered the same as an employee of Rocky Mountain National Park. And the, the superintendent of Rocky knows that I talk like this about this, so just <laughs> so I'm transparent with you people. So now we don't have any more lodges. As of 2011, the last commercial operation of lodging ended in Rocky Mountain National Park. Rocky Mountain National Park. At one time, they had 850 lodging capacity. Now there's none. They do have 571 campsites throughout the park, but that includes 100 of them that are in the backcountry you have to hike to. Okay? Should we leave it like that? Yes. Or should we have large hotels and resorts like they have at Yellowstone, Yosemite, the, the mall? How many have been to the shopping mall at Yosemite? Okay? Should we have that in Rocky? Or should we have the open Kawanichi Valley? Yes. Should we have the open Moraine Park, the open Glacier Basin, mm -hmm. the open Horseshoe Park? That's not for me to answer, okay? There was some discussion a, a number of years back, about eight or nine years ago, about opening a very large lodge uh, in the Glacier Basin, and the people found out that they were gonna have to bring their own infrastructure all the way from the town of Estes Park. In other words, they had to bring their own sewer system almost 11 miles, they had to bring in their own electric generating plant, everything else, because the park barely has enough sewer capacity for the park, and they wouldn't let them tap into it. Just the infrastructure development of the road and the sewer and electricity looked like it was going to be somewhere between 14 and 20 million dollars to make that happen. And then they were going to build this glorious lodge. Well, right away, they, they you know, it doesn't take a financial genius. They decided against that pretty quickly. Okay? So should we leave it for some of these guys? Yeah. Or some of these guys? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Yeah.